To measure how this negative feedback is working, you, what you can do is a, um, <clears throat> a cortisol suppression, a suppression test. So what you do is you get a synthetic version of cortisol, which fools the hypothalamus into thinking there is a high level of cortisol circulating in the blood when there really isn't. If um, negative feedback is working correctly, hypothalamus stops um, releasing CRH and cortisol levels lower. If negative feedback is not working, this does not happen and we have a problem. This test shows up depression, but it shows up many other illnesses such as Cushing's disease, so it is not reliable. But it does show that depression has a biological marker. Now, what can Zoloft and Paxil do for this? Alright, so <clears throat> this release of extra cortisol, what it does is it can inhab inha inhibit, sorry, pardon me, something called brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, <clears throat> and what happens to this, it's sort of like a nutrient thing in the brain, it can lead to atrophy of various brain parts and sometimes cell death. Well, if you add um, some sort of serotonin or norepinephrine kind of thing in there, this increases cyclic AMP in the brain and um, that increase in cyclic AMP um, causes an increase in responsive element binding protein and this binding protein will increase brain derived neurotrophic factor. A lot of people also misunderstand the term chemical imbalance in the brain. What is it? Well in depression um, it used to be thought that is just an underproduction of serotonin. But an underproduction of serotonin is it's evident in a lot of different kind of illnesses and things like that. Underproduction of dopamine. And the um it's not the actual chemical itself, the serotonin which is what's causing the effect. It's the receptor and the response the cell has to the chemical which is causing the effect. Kind of like a lock and key, we're using a loose analogy. It's the door that opens and the room that is the effect. The key really does nothing, but the key inserted into the lock opens the door, you get me? Now how serotonin reuptake inhibitors work? Alright, um, compare first ecstasy. Effects are immediate, you get happy or whatever right away, because that, you know, increases that serotonin immediately in the brain. Antidepressants don't work like that. They work after two weeks. And how this works is because it causes an increase of serotonin by blocking the reuptake mechanisms. And this increase of serotonin is stimulating those receptors. And after a while, the receptors are down-regulating because the cell can sense there's an abnormal amount of serotonin. So what it's thought to be is depression is um, too many um, receptors for serotonin, there's different kinds, mind you, present in specific parts of the brain. The research has been done on all different body parts and it's putting the information together, which is what my textbooks here have done today, which is the hard part because this involves deduction and drawing conclusions from evidence. And of course, um, that's not as pure as evidence itself. But evidence by itself is meaningless, I'm afraid. Okay, for example, the evidence may state there's increased blood flow to the amygdala in depressed, pa uh, depressed patients compared to normal controls. And this result is statistically significant to the 0.001 value. What that means is it's, there's a 0.001 chance that this has happened to chance. It has nothing to do with depression. But the rest is, um, the rest of the 0.999 whatever is that it's due to depression. You might see that evidence and you might also get the evidence that the amygdala is heavily involved in the fear and the stress response and you can put two and two together 
and say um, abnormal activation of the amygdala is causing the depression. But that, that conclusion drawn there may or may not be actually true. You don't know. And this is what uh, J. Wolf has done, is critically analyse these sorts of conclusions drawn. And this is good, this is what we should all do, if we all have scientific degrees, that is. And the scientific method's purpose is to disprove a hypothesis using vigorous testing instead of trying to support it. Because in the scientific wor world, you're not allowed to say, I proved my hypothesis. You can say the evidence supports the hypothesis, but never proves. Because you never know in the future, someone might come along, find a different kind of test that your hypothesis can no longer pass. So, if you want to make a claim that you cannot prove the existence of depression, logically that is a true claim because you can't prove anything. <clears throat> but it is also an unfair claim and you, can't, you can also apply the same. You can't prove diabetes, you can't prove cancer. And Jay Wolf's also right in the fact that antidepressants are not a perfect <clears throat> treatment for depression. Hopefully in the future that will change and I hope to contribute a lot to this research. But on the other hand, I feel that you cannot say psychiatry is complete bullshit and antidepressants are complete bullshit because they have helped people. People have felt so low that they have wanted to kill themselves, have been put on medication and have felt fine. On the other hand, some people have felt the same and medication did shit all. It depends on the person. And this is not an all or nothing situation. It's bullshit or it's not. It depends on the person. It's really complicated. You can't also, I, I'm hoping this will change in the future, but the mental illnesses are not categorised by their, their biological markers, as you'd like to say. So one of the criteria for depression is not abnormal negative feedback or abnormal amygdala activation. <clears throat> this is just the scientific evidence found, not a DSM diagnosis criteria. Of course, abnormal activation of the amygdala is also present in other disorders such as anxiety disorders. So it's not a character characterising diagnosis of um, depression either. So it doesn't work there. Because the brain is complicated, it's systems working together, it's billions of tiny little nerve cells working to make your little souls. And because the brain is such a huge network, it's hard to find where a problem originates. You can find something abnormal happening somewhere, but what actually caused it? That's a question scientists are finding really hard to um, answer. That goes with other disorders, cancer. No one knows exactly what causes cancer and all the different kinds of cancers. Even diabetes, AIDS and whatever. Sometimes it's the HIV virus, sometimes it's thought to be idiopathic, meaning we don't know. And of course, unfortunately, because of this, Basically, um, our method is to throw something at the brain and if it works, good, we'll use it for now until we do more research and find something better. At the moment, I'm looking at the effects of oxytocin on depression and anxiety. So, we'll see what kind of treatment that may come up with in a couple of years or a decade or so. To say psychiatry is bullshit and that depression does not exist is basically to piss on centuries and centuries of hard work and research done. Now I'm I'm not in this for, you know, to make millions of dollars and to profit off someone's misery. I'm in this out of interest. I really want to know what's going on. And depression and anxiety and all that, that's what's bullshit diseases. Diseases make people's lives miserable. And I want to I want to stop those and and um, to stop those we've got to know what's causing it exactly and why and how and that's what research is for.